Hi everyone, I'm Sarkan. Um, I'm postdoctoral researcher in OpenGeo Hub. And uh, in this workshop, we will talk about uh, the uh, high resolution gross primary productivity uh, map we, we produced in 30 meter resolution globally uh, by monthly. Uh, so, we're going to talk about how we uh, came up with this product and the dynamics and the, uh, how we can. Uh, use this product to to uh, to further understand the dynamics of the mer world, uh, usually in climate uh, uh, and agriculture and land degradation and uh, land potential uh, uh, mapping. Yeah. Okay, so. Um, for the theoretical background, this is the, the, the foundation of the process-based model uh, we use for the uh, uh, gross primary productivity. It's basically a light use efficiency model uh, where uh, it uh, actually uh, creates a relationship between the incoming uh, radiation and uh, the amount of absorbed uh, fraction of this uh, solar radiation and how efficient the uh, vegetation layer, the biomass, actually uh, uses this uh, radiation to to uh, to convert the the, the available uh, the available uh, carbon uh, uh, carbon intake. So. Um, basically, it has three um, parts, uh, the uh, photosynthetic active radiation, the fraction of the observed uh, radiation, and the light use efficiency part, which gives us the idea of how efficient the vegetation layer is, actually. So, um, so to break up this equation into parts by parts, so, so we can track how the high resolution part is actually constructed from uh, these uh, Earth, observation, uh, uh, Earth observations. So for the first part, the, the photosynthetically active radiation, we are using uh, um, uh, the product from MODIS. It's called uh, Keras Clouds and the Earth. Uh, Earth's radiant uh, e energy system, which is uh, in one degree by one degree resolution and uh, served as a monthly product. And uh, for the second part, um, the the far part, the fraction of the absorbed radiation, and for that we are using uh, mainly Landsat in 30 meter resolution, which is the highest resolution uh, product in here. And uh, the theory is based on the Robinson et al. Uh, 2018 uh, for the uh, primary production mapping in Conus region, and um, the in this in this. Um, in this relation, we are uh, calculating the FAPAR based on the globally adjusted uh, coefficients of uh, minimum and maximum NDVI. And it, since it's globally adjusted, then globally adjusted and for all uh, vegetations, uh, by the way, so it's not actually a vegetation-based uh, adjusted or calibrated value, it's a global value. And um, for the 30-meter uh, bimonthly uh, uh, Landsat uh, time series, you are already familiar uh, with this product from uh, yesterday's Davides workshop on uh, the uh, on how to produce a cloud cover, uh, the cloud-free, gap-free Landsat uh, archive. So, uh, and the, for the last part, uh, how efficient the vegetation is, uh, it's actually based on three parts where uh, we are using the land surface temperature uh, from MODIS, uh, the land surface water index, uh, again, from Landsat time series, and also um, a lookup table where uh, it tells us uh, which uh, biomes, actually, uh, how much productive uh, in terms of uh, converting these uh, active radiation into uh, carbon. So um, for this uh, lookup table, as you see, uh, we have some uh, biome classes uh, already defined in IGBP uh, classification uh, from the MODIS product. Uh, but of course, there are some other uh, classifications and corresponding light use efficiency, is light use efficiency values, and we will discuss them uh, later. So for, uh, for, the, uh, for the scalar uh, temperature value, uh, we are actually uh, using a range of tools uh, approach to calculate uh, calculate uh, the 
uh, the optimum T value using the minimum, maximum, and optimum uh, temperatures uh, determined in centigrade degree. And uh, th since these values are in bimonthly time period, and uh, the Landsat time series we are using is in bimonthly temporal period, uh, we are taking the uh, the median value, the average value, uh, basically, uh, to create a bimonthly uh, values uh, that corresponds to Landsat uh, Landsat uh, temporal frame. But of course, the this for the special resolution. Uh, in order to match the 30 meter uh, special resolution, these values are actually downscaled uh, using a, an interpolation technique uh, to match each uh, Landsat pixels. And uh, this is the final part of the light use efficiency uh, part, uh, which is again uh, from Robinson et al. This light uh, land surface water index, which basically we are exploiting the uh, the near infrared and uh, short wavelength infrared uh, bands of Landsat to cal uh, to calculate the water indication uh, in a 30 meter resolution. So of course, uh, the uh, apart from the T scalar and uh, V scalar, which come from the uh, the satellite observations, and now we need to decide how efficient uh, the vegetation actually uses this information and converts into into a carbon. Uh, so of course, um, this is usually uh, observed uh, locally, regionally, or globally uh, based on some observations, uh, radiation, uh, active radiation observations, and the productivity uh, in which the biome is actually uh, act. So um, this is usually um, uh, regionally or locally adjusted values because uh, this is usually temperature or climate dependent uh, value or because the same biome can be uh, productive uh, in a different way in different climates or different regions. So it's not more of a global scale, a global value, but uh, of course, there are some globally adjusted fixed values that we can exploit uh, for uh, global mapping as well. So um, this is the summary of the 30-meter uh, resolution competition. But of course, um, the, the most problematic part in here is the light use efficiency factor, uh, which again, uh, we mentioned that it's, this is globally adjusted value usually, and uh, it's not uh, showing uh, local or regional uh, regimes, or re local or regional productivity clearly. So that's why, uh, as, an, um, as an alternative, we uh, removed the light use efficiency factor, the optimum light use efficiency factor, from the equation uh, to have a, a land uh, cover independent uh, primary productivity map. So in this case, uh, we are taking this light use efficiency value as constant, as one, uh, so that the overall uh, value is actually independent of the land cover uh, itself. So um, why is this important? Of course, um, f f in all these parts, only the light use land cover part is actually um, not directly a biophysical or geophysical value observed, uh, but actually a derived product. So it's actually subject to uh, more uh, errors, of course. And um, actually, um, there are lots of land use land cover maps that uh, one can uh, discuss which one is actually more qualified or uh, more accurate to represent some region or global, maybe. Uh, so to avoid that, you can use your own uh, land cover land use map uh, or the one you favor or the one you actually nearly created to, uh, to check the lookup table uh, in which uh, tells us uh, which biome is actually how much productive. So you can calc so you can multiply each pixels with that light use efficiency factor and uh, create a, a adjusted calibrated GPP value. So we are uh, calling this first um, first product that is independent from the light light use factor is uncalibrated Earth observation based GPP. And the final value will be uh, the adjusted calibrated GPP uh, on your own. Um, of course, uh, the if you use the exploit the lookup tables uh, with your uh, land use land cover model, uh, so you can directly uh, map 
the lookup table to your uh, land use land cover and create a land use efficiency map uh, that can be uh, used as a direct vectorized multiplication with the uh, uncalibrated GPP product. So eventually you can calibrate the, um, the map uh, directly. And of course, there are already uh, some, uh, some studies on uh, calculating the optimum maximum light use efficiency factor. Of course, this term is maximum light use efficiency factor, which means if everything goes well, uh, the vegetation is this much of active. Uh, so um, there are some actually um, uh, studies that try to uh, map the regional, local, also global dynamics of this uh, light use efficiency value. And um, this map is uh, actually from the um, publication you see on the left. Uh, GIMS uh, product, and um, this is uh, this study is actually um, th th this study actually bases on uh, how um, under how these uh, globally adjusted factors uh, underestimate or overestimate some values in different regions, and it's not quite uh, well adjusted to the climate and regions dynamics. So that's why they are creating this sort of uh, maps uh, to be able to better represent the productivity in every regions. Um, of course, they are prone to errors depending on uh, their resolutions and also uh, temporary resolutions, of course. Uh, but uh, mostly a special resolution is the uh, limiting factor uh, in this case. But um, most of the studies that tries to uh, model this uh, efficiency uh, is usually based on uh, the f uh, FlexNet observations uh, and station-based uh, computations of uh, how efficient the biome is actually uh, is. So, um, to give an overview of this uh, whole GPP production, um, we are um, we are uh, using 30 meter Landsat archive with uh, one degree uh, radi active radiation and one kilometer uh, land surface temperature to uh, to achieve a th uh, eventually a 30 meter uh, resolution by monthly uh, GPP uh, GPP values. Of course, uh, the the um, the GPP values we have is the daily GPP values in that bimonthly period. So, which means it's the mean daily value within that bimonthly uh, period. So, it's uh, in a unit, it's gram carbon per meter square per day. Uh, to get the whole period or an accumulated period, you have, we have to multiply with the the amount of time frame in which it's calculated, actually. So we see these uncalibrated uh, art observation made GPP uh, as an intermediate peri uh, product. Um, um, but also we have some, uh, some products uh, focused uh, mo uh, on the grassland dynamics. So that's why um, there are the final products are uh, in the uh, uh, grassland regions where they are actually the the uncalibrated uh, GPP values are masked uh, yearly based on the the uh, the grassland maps and uh, multiplied with the of course the grassland uh, light use efficiency factor uh, to achieve the final uh, GPP values in the grassland and also some derived derived uh, maps uh, accumul yearly accumulations. Uh, and also the trend maps uh, to be able to see uh, the land degradation patterns or uh, land deformation and also uh, some climatic uh, uh, activities. So uh, this is the first high resolution 30 meter uh, GPP product in a global scale. Uh, and uh, the, 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 the temporal coverage is actually uh, quite nice. It uh, actually spans more than two decades. So uh, to be able to calculate, uh, a do a trend analysis and see the dynamics of the GPP in this long uh, scale is actually uh, quite advantageous. And uh, since it's a land cover independent productivity, it's actually quite flexible to play with uh, and uh, adapt on your own data sets as well. And overall, it's now about uh, 23, 24 terabytes of uh, cloud optimized TIFFs where uh, we are planning to uh, serve them uh, under uh, Open Land Map Stack Catalog and uh, also uh, in Google Earth Engine, uh, which I will show you uh, later. 
and all, um, of course, uh, not just the uncalibrated, the GPP part, also some uh, focused products on the uh, grassland um, as well. So um, for, the, uh, for the project, of course, the Open Earth Monitor uh, project, it's uh, directly related to the, the land degradation uh, neutrality tool, and uh, also since uh, we are we can we can derive the uh, the amount of carbon up intake so it's uh, also a part of a soil uh, carbon accounting system and uh, f for the global monitoring system of for a uh, livestock and uh, grassland pasture uh, to to monitor grassland dynamics uh, of course so uh, here is the uh, the gpp uh, the uncalibrated uh, gpp values in 2022 uh, in a bi-monthly uh, period, and you see the, the temporal changes in this uh, next period. And uh, we can clearly see the dynamics based on the uh, in the northern and southern hemisphere, based on the uh, seasonality, of course. Uh, of course, in here, temperature is uh, quite a, uh, a dominant factor uh, for the productivity, and it actually follows the patterns in of winter and summer seasons uh, dynamics, of course. And the scale is a bit uh, actually accumulated after uh, after 10 uh, gram carbon per uh, per day, of course, uh, to to better uh, visualize uh, the dynamics in the, uh, the, the the dynamics in the world. So. And these are the uh, these are the accumulated GPP values. Um, uh, calculated from the bimonthly uh, series, and these are quite informative uh, for the uh, for the land degradation and uh, climate studies, of course. And uh, the values are, uh, of course, uh, it's the, the mean value of each bimonthly period within that year, and uh, multiplied with the with uh, the yearly day uh, to to achieve uh, gram carbon per meter square in uh, in that year, of course. And it's it's uh, it's really a long uh, temporal uh, temporal period to have a GPP values for uh, spanning about 22 years uh, for the accumulated uh, GPP values. And uh, as a last product, uh, as we said, we are focusing on the the grassland dynamics, of course, and it uh, it's. A it's based on uh, this uh, preprint, uh, which uh, you've seen its presentation uh, given by uh, Leandro uh, two days ago, as far as I remember, the first day of the workshop. And you see how we map the dynamics of the, the grassland. And these values, uh, this product is uh, mainly masked for uh, each year using the, the grassland uh, maps. Uh, to have a specific uh, GPP product only for these uh, to to, po to monitor uh, pasture lands. Yeah. Of course, uh, um, we we have to be aware of the limitations of the maps uh, as well. So, uh, since it is it is the highest resolution uh, GPP product uh, uh, globally, but uh, with with the high resolution also comes with some price, of course. Uh, so, uh, the amount of productivity uh, is shown in this uh, productivity maps. Of course, uh, if everything goes well, what does that mean? So, if the vegetation is actually fully uh, actively uh, uses the uh, the observed radiation and turns it into the productivity, the carbon. Uh, this actually uh, shows uh, the perfect scenario. So of course, uh, the, the 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 vegetation is actually subject to uh, different kind of stress, like photo stress or crop stress or. Uh, any ad additional uh, factors that can affect the, the, the health of the vegetation is actually uh, prone to error in this uh, modeling, of course. This is um, the, the, the theoretical maximum uh, light use efficiency value implied here, and the other factors cannot directly uh, show uh, the dynamics in that year, in that certain period, uh, what happened to the biomass, what happened to the, the biome, and uh, if there's a uh, stressing factor that affects the productivity, this is actually not uh, directly uh, modeled in here. So 
and uh, it's not sensitive to uh, the uh, the climate extremes, of course, because uh, to to be able to uh, to be able to map the climate extreme, we need to have a higher temper uh, temper resolution, and in in this bimonthly period, it's actually uh, smooths, of course, these uh, extremes and uh, and uh, like heat waves or droughts, and it's uh, even with. Uh, increased temper accuracy, uh, we may not even uh, able to get caught, uh, get uh, the idea of how much drought actually affects the productivity. To be able to do that, we need to have a certain additional data sets to, to imply the, uh, the change in the productivity, of course. But there are some nice studies on, uh, on uh, how, how these climate extremes actually affect the, the productivity, uh, of course. Uh, but I I really enjoy the the the, the one on the right because most of the uh, climate scenarios and most of the uh, the studies who does these analysis on the gross primary productivity is actually usually on the uh, the worst scenarios like uh, this this is actually affecting worse the productivity blah blah uh, but uh, the one on the right is actually uh, trying to search for the positive impacts of these uh, the uh, effects on the gross primary productivity it's like uh, it's like trying to find a silver lining uh, <laughs> after all but uh, it's nice that we we can still some see positive uh, gross primary productivity extremes as well uh, which, which I think is something a topic uh, under <laughs> uh, under discussed actually and of course the most uh, as I said the most limiting factor in the uh, in the resolution in here is actually the 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 temporal the temperature uh, from uh, the modis product with land surface temperature because uh, it's um, the, the the model uh, assumes that there is no productivity uh, under zero uh, centigrade degree uh, temperature. Uh, of course, this is actually works for most of the biomes, but there's still a productivity uh, in extreme cases, uh, especially uh, especially for the tree covers, of course, because uh, for the uh, C4 um, agricultural products or other products, it's usually, of course, it's enough to estimate that there is no photosynthetic activity, uh, but um, it may lead to some uh, underestimations in the tree cover regions. And uh, here uh, I show you some examples in, uh, from uh, Russia uh, in 2008, March, April period. And uh, on, l on the l right side, uh, you see the land surface temperature in uh, one kilometer uh, downscaled to 30 uh, meter. And the blue regions are the, uh, the parts where, uh, where the actual land surface temperature hits to zero. So this pattern is directly uh, influencing the, f the final uh, GPP pattern uh, directly. So this is a limiting factor in those regions, of course. So uh, if, if we can have a better uh, special resolution in that term, of course, this, will, uh, this can increase the, uh, the GPP patterns uh, in, uh, in those regions and for those by monthly periods as well. Yeah. So, um, how accurate these uh, GPP maps? And to uh, to to be able to answer this uh, question, uh, we we can look uh, the eddy covariance uh, flag towers. Uh, we can exploit them to validate our GPP models. And uh, so uh, these are the uh, the flag towers networks we we used for the validations. Uh, the FlaxNet 2015. I think this is the most famous uh, data set uh, used, uh, which is global. Um, uh, you s they are uh, the black dots you see on the uh, map and um, the other um, regional networks ICOS uh, from the Europe and Ameriflux and Ausflux from Australia and uh, you see that there are some common uh, stations of course because FlaxNet is actually FlaxNet 2015 dataset actually is a combination from these uh, different networks uh, as far as I remember from 1991 to 2015 uh, they gathered uh, the uh, daily values of the uh, flux uh, measurements, and uh, yeah, uh, this is the this is the uh, the distribution of uh, land covers in the 2015 uh, FluxNet data set, which is quite uh, diverse uh, and. Uh, 
there are some stations that has uh, a, sp a span of t uh, over two y 20 years of a period. So of course, uh, we cannot use the, the period uh, below uh, before 2000, because we are mainly producing the maps between 2000 and 2022. And so for that, we actually use the additional uh, local uh, networks uh, to be able to access the, uh, the period after 2015. And so um, um, this is more or less the overall um, view of uh, how, how accurate the, uh, the GPP value actually is uh, doing in different uh, biomes. Uh, of course, in different networks, not all biomes are covered, uh, so it actually changes a lot. But uh, overall, uh, the, uh, the, RM, uh, the RMSE values in different networks is around uh, 2 uh, gram carbon uh, per meter squared day. Uh, with uh, in the ICOS, it's a bit higher, uh, but uh, generally, it's um, the problems are in the uh, the forest biomass, which is typically expected a bit. Uh, like uh, I said, the model actually assumes uh, at zero temperature value, um, which is actually underestimates uh, some parts of the forest uh, forest productivity, of course, but. To be able to uh, accurately see also the, 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 the dynamics in the grassland region and the uh, overall separately, we, uh, we separated the, uh, the analysis uh, as all land covers and grassland. In the upper, you see the all land covers. Uh, which is, uh, and from left to right, uh, Fluxnet 2015, uh, Ameriflux, Icos, and uh, Osflux uh, results. And uh, you see that uh, for all stations, uh, for all uh, networks, the, the correlation value is quite high. And it's, it, it, it actually, the model actually can grasp the dynamics of the GPP quite well. Uh, but uh, there's a, a bit of a drop down in uh, Osflux in the Australia region, which is actually uh, the only network in the southern hemisphere, and the others are usually have data set in the home, uh, northern hemisphere. Northern hemisphere, uh, and it's because the, the this analysis is conducted with a uh, mod 17 light use efficiency factor, which is globally adjusted light use efficiency values. And these values actually uh, underestimate and overestimate in different regions. So uh, when you look up the only the correlation value, we are actually uh, doing fine in, uh, in Australia, because we have 0 0.88, nearly 0 0.8 correlation value. But when you see uh, the, uh, the uh, when you see the RMS, RMSE value or R square value, it drops down quickly, which means uh, the model actually can grasp the dynamics, but uh, the value is directly not representing the value, the real value itself. So with the uh, adjustment of the light use efficiency factor, it should be actually increasing uh, better. And this is a more a focused uh, comparison with the uh, Robinson et al., which in which they uh, focused on only on the Conus region uh, for high-resolution productivity mapping as well. They used Landsat 30 meter and also uh, downscaled uh, the um, the modest product to 250 meter. What is interesting about their work is that they uh, compared the uh, mod 17 parameters with the optimum light use efficiency values they found. Uh, using only the flux towers uh, in the conus regions, and they adjusted the GPP values. And we compared both with mod 17 and also optimized factors. And uh, for that, uh, in the grassland regions, uh, even though we're still using the mod 17 algorithm, the, uh, the performance of the GPP value is still actually uh, best uh, in comparison to MODIS and Landsat uh, products. And uh, you see the direct comparison of these two maps. Uh, the one on the right, the one on the left is uh, our product. The one on the left is from the Conus region. Uh, but th the problem is uh, the, uh, the GPP values uh, in the Conus region are much higher than, uh, in, than uh, our product in the uncalibrated uh, version. Of course, this is ex expected because not 
directly multiplied with the light use efficiency factor, but the, the factor is about like a half of the value in the conus region. So uh, when we look up, uh, when we look the f uh, optimum light use efficiency value uh, in the Robinson at all, this actually clearly shows why is the why is this case? Because th in the mod 17, the, uh, the uh, for the crop land regions, the optimum uh, factor is 1.04, but they found nearly the two times of this value, which is uh, which shows that this value is actually underestimates uh, a lot. Uh, the productivity in the cropland regions. But uh, in our map, of course, we can clearly see the croplands regions separately, but of course, uh, in the other map, it's not uh, quite visible. Uh, so uh, I'll do a small uh, um, demonstration with Google Collapse, and uh, you have the links, of course, if you'd like to do. You can also add. Uh, you can also uh, do it with me. Sure. Yeah, okay. Uh, so uh, I will show you how to, uh, how to uh, visualize, how to access, of course, but I have to visualize the, uh, the uncalibrated GPP map. Uh, and uh, a little demonstration on how we can actually uh, use one of the land use land cover map and convert to GP real GPP values, of course. And for that, we only need a Rasteria to, to access the data and visualize it. And uh, if you like to do, this is actually not necessarily, but uh, to, to create a map, of course, we can use Cartopy. I don't know if you are using or not. Um, so, um, this is the uh, already uh, given link for the 2022 uh, April and June uh, period. And of course, the, the amount of the data set is actually extremely large, by the way. It's, this is the global 30 meter resolution. It's about 150 gigabyte or 170, so as far as I remember. So, But since it's uh, cloud optimized data, it has different uh, level of abstractions where we can access, uh, because if you are trying to access the original high resolution, that would take amount of time, and as well as uh, the, uh, the capacity is limited. So uh, I will only use the one of the overviews, but uh, if you'd like to see uh, the, uh, the number of overviews and uh, what kind of level of abstraction we have, uh, I already uh, gave some code about it, and uh, you can run and see different uh, over overview levels, like from 246 to 2048. Uh, so to, to, uh, to do this faster, I, I used the 1024 one. Uh, so uh, here, put a constraint on the overview, the which overview we should use. And based on this overview, we are doing a decimated reading called decimated reading in Rasterio, where we uh, reshape the out shape uh, while we are reading. And uh, this is the, uh, the global uh, map for that bimonthly period. And of course, uh, if you'd like to put it in a, a better frame, uh, you can exploit a uh, cartopy, uh, which I gave some codes on how to uh, get uh, some uh, physical properties on the map as well, if you're interested. And this may be a bit, a bit of a uh, different projection than maybe you're used to, but this is something we are, uh, we'd like to use a lot lately. And, uh, so we can have a, a, a global map of GPP uh, using this uh, code uh, sequence. Yeah. Of course, uh, again, in here, I uh, played with the, uh, the, uh, the color bar here to, to do some uh, power normalization uh, because there is some accumulation in different regions, to, but to, to have a better uh, visualization, uh, we, we needed to play with that. <laughs> so. Uh, so let's try to take a, a small portion of it in the highest resolution. Uh, one degree by one degree region in the Luxembourg region I tried, by the way. Uh, this is the uncalibrated GPP uh, in the uh, in our area, and uh, also I took uh, the uh, land use land cover uh, from Modis, 
And uh, since, of course, this uh, product is in 500 meter resolution, which, of course, your model, your uh, map al can also be, uh, I do some nearest neighborhood interpolation uh, to replicate the values in the 30 meter pixel pixel level. So this is the uh, the final uh, interpolated uh, land use land cover uh, uh, map, and this is. Uh, Sorry, okay, this is the, yeah, this is the final map uh, where uh, you can see with the class values, of course. Uh, the 70, there are 17 classes uh, in IGBP classification and the corresponding light use efficiency factor adjusted globally. So we can map this dictionary to, uh, directly to land use land cover to get a light use efficiency map directly and you can use this value to multiply the uncalibrated GPP values to get a calibrated GPP. Uh, and this is the final comparison uh, of uncalibrated and calibrated GPP values. Of course, the area is, I think, d mostly dominated with the forest cover. So you can see that the values are increasing in the right part in the uh, forest values. Uh, I'm sorry I had to go fast in a bit, so because I ran out of time. <laughs> but uh, you have the copy of this uh, notebook, and you can uh, run it and uh, play with it. Yeah, thank you.